Hello folks, this is Nathan and uh, what I want to do now is to go through uh, Daniel chapter 4. This is something I've been doing over the last few weeks with folks from the uh, Dry Bones Fellowship uh, that I attend, online albeit. So let's just jump into it, but to give you an idea what's going to happen, we're going to talk about Daniel 4 obviously and the second dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And we're going to try to relate that to our present situation, particularly with regard to the United Kingdom and the um, political turmoil, let's just say. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you're blessed by it. And I hope that the Lord touches your heart uh, and encourages you and um, challenges you to conform to what he demands of us. Uh, Lord, help us as we go about this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So... Uh, it's fun, I think, to see the uh, Hebrew <laughs> text there. You know, I don't read Hebrew, but it, it can be helpful sometimes because it gives you direct access to the um, uh, to the words. And there are some things that I might want to point out. So let's re read through. It's quite a long verse, 1 to 37, um, and uh, observe things as we go. Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all the peoples. Now, all the peoples, all the peoples. What does that mean? Well, uh, Babylon was the at that time the Neo-Babylonian Empire. It was the head of gold in the person of Nebuchadnezzar. And it ruled a vast realm and it was very glorious. But beyond the direct political control, what do we find? Babylon uh, in, as a type and Babylon right here, right now, that Babylon um, was a trading empire and it exerted its strength through trade. So uh, beyond its borders, its influence uh, was uh, very great as well. So when they say all the peoples, they don't mean every single one without fail, but they're covering a lot of bases and they're really not exaggerating too much. Um, really, this was, after all, the one world order of the time. Let's not forget. OK. Now, Nebuchadnezzar the king to all the peoples. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is the Bible. Isn't this the Bible? Yeah. Who's writing this section, 1 to 37? It's entirely verbatim. It's from the pen of none other than the head of gold himself, ladies and gentlemen. It's Nebuchadnezzar. Wow. This is a formerly pagan, now believing um, uh, potentate, the head of gold, the most glorious king ever. And he's writing this by his own pen, as it were. This is an epistle to the Babylonians from the king of Babylon. Wow. And we'll see over the course of it how God has worked this change. And don't forget the revelations that Nebuchadnezzar uh, has are progressive in that he has the dream and then he witnesses the courage of Hananiah, Israel, and Azariah. And um, he, his worldview is chipped away at God speaks to him and he speaks to them uh, and he applies the right medicine at the right time to turn him around. Okay. Uh, uh, to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, again, all the earth, may your peace abound. And uh, there's a lot here, even in verse 1. <laughs> wow. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. And uh, signs and wonders, they're, we tend to look at miracles as just things that don't, don't normally happen that God does. Uh, but what we count as miracles very often, for example, in the book of John, they count as signs and wonders. And they're not just to like fireworks to make us go, "Woo, ah, that was amazing. But again, uh, to tell us about God, if we want to know what a particular se text says, we ask, what is it telling us about God? That's the primary thing. It doesn't uh, exhaust the meaning. It doesn't mean that uh, we as men mean nothing far from it. Uh, we bear the image of God. That's uh, that's why we're um, in such have such responsibilities. But uh, they're signs and wonders, which means that they're revealing to us, uh, to Him, something about God. How great are His signs, and how mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and His dominion is from generation to generation. Let's have a look at that. Shultan. 
Uh, it's a, you'll find that in Hungarian, that uh, Zoltán being used as a name. Fantastic name. In other translations, it's translated as uh, sovereignty. But dominion, oh, how we hit this word. Oh, it's awful. It's terrible. Oh, no, wait, hang, on, hang on a second. It's a Bible word. You've got to deal with it. You've you got to deal with it. If you despise it, well, if you're despising a part of the word of God. So what are the two things? What are the three things he says? His signs and wonders are tremendous. His kingdom. This is a king talking. This is the head of gold talking who has taken God's items and uh, play, have it, had it placed in his own treasure house, in his own house, in his own temple uh, to the gods. Uh, he's taken this other kingdom, Israel, and he's just wiped the floor with him and moved on to the next thing. But here he is, the head of gold, ruling over mighty Babylon, saying that his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. He has been touched. He's seen the real importance of God's kingdom. And often we made, make the gospel and salvation, oh, how we pervert it. We make it something about us. How ghastly, how perverted to make the beginning and the ending of the gospel about us. It's the gospel of the kingdom that God gives us. And here we have uh, Nebuchadnezzar touched by God in so many ways and so deeply. And now he talks about his kingdom being an everlasting kingdom. Again, um, we see the word uh, Malku related to Melech. So um, uh, kingdoms aren't bad in themselves. There are people that say, oh, the state, let's destroy the state. Let's meaning the, the you know, all authority and so on. Well, that's not a Christian thing. We, we serve a king. And remember, as we approach Christ, as we're thinking about Christ, he's not just our friend. He's not just our tender companion, as it were. He's also a king. We have to factor that in. From gener His dominion is from generation to generation. And we wonder, will the cause of Christ survive? Will it survive? Well, here we have God speaking through by the Holy Spirit, through Nebuchadnezzar. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And the, the burden of the second, uh, the, 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 the chapter 2, the first vision, was that uh, this stone cut uh, from the um, uh, mountain is hurtled towards this statue. It's thrown towards this statue. It touches the feet. The feet crumble and the rest of it explode all at once. What is the everlasting kingdom? What is the kingdom that cannot be shaken? Only Christ's kingdom, which looks to our eyes so frail and so weak. And it has none of these impressive buildings that um, Nebuchadnezzar had. And yet it is the abiding kingdom. So let's not look in the wrong places for the enduring kingdom. The WEF will be a footnote in history in a generation's time, as will the EU. <laughs> but the kingdom of God marches on. Praise the Lord. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house. Ah, house. So this is the house, the bayith. This is where he's put the items of the treasury of God's um, of, of uh, the Lord's house and just like with um, the Ark of the Covenant being taken into the temple of Dagon it's tr it troubles it has a troubling effect with Dagon Poof, it prostrated itself before the Ark of the Lord you know you can't capture God you can't put him in the box in terms of trying to make him say and uh, be uh, what he doesn't want to uh, what he do hasn't said and will never be at ease and flourishing in my palace. Hmm. Well, God's not going to make much of an impact with us when we're when things are riding high. You know, often he has to bring us down. Boy, is he going to be brought down. And again, a dream comes. I saw a dream. If you're dreaming, uh, as a king, you have, uh, when you're awake, you have the power. And he had immense power and wealth like none other. And he could just say, do that, and it would be done. But when you're dreaming, wow. What can you do? Who can you command? What command has any man over his dreams? None. So God speaks to him when he's tr totally passive as it were. Uh, he can't act. God speaks to him. I saw a dream and it made me fearful once again. And these fantasies, strange words, strange choice of words there in the translation, um, imagining fantasy, uh, I lay on my bed. Uh, bear that in mind. That's important for later. Fantasy. Uh, 
And the visions in my mind kept alarming me. So this was disturbing, of course. So I give orders to bring into my, so he's back in, into consciousness. He's commanding people. All right. Give orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. And here's the thing. People uh, put a lot of faith in the power of uh, uh, the, the occult, not just occultists, but often Christians. They, they say, oh, uh, this and this thing, or uh, the, like the Gotthard Tunnel, for example, all the occult ritual that went in symbolism and the previous uh, the Olympics that were held in London. Oh, yeah, this is the occult and that's the occult and what, what have you. But here we have the very center of uh, you've got the best of the best, the cream of the crop of the magicians and conjurers, the Chaldeans and the diviners. And boy, they're a doff lot. What, what can they do? What can they do? And let me remind you, there's no curse against Israel and there's no divination against, um, I can't remember the scripture, but I believe it's in the book of Numbers, possibly. Um, you can look it up yourself. Diviners came in and I related to the dream to them. Unlike the first dream, he, acts, he tells them the dream. But, ah, predictably, they could not make its interpretation known to me. And you find later why that is. Because what's coming is so outside of the uh, um, worldview. It's just impossible for the, the religion of... Um, religion of the Chaldeans to understand it. All paganism is like that. There is, There are two religions. As essentially, well, let's, let's, say, let's say it this way. It's probably valid. There's the Christian religion and there's everything else in many respects. And uh, the worldview that goes along with all, those, all these uh, other religions are totally hostile and antithetical in principle to uh, the Word of God and the uh, God Himself, the Person of God. And so it's not just that they're dumb, stupid people. Uh, far from it. I'm sure they were great experts in their field. But the interpretation, even though the dream was given to them, they, they didn't even come up, you notice, with any guesses. Well, I think it means this. <laughs> it was just so topsy-turvy for them. Uh, and uh, Im impossible. Okay. People say, oh, miracles are impossible. Well, you, you tell them the miracles and uh, you say, well, that happened. Uh, and there were so many wish witnesses, 500 uh, people at once Jesus ap appealed to. And, well, that would take uh, several weeks for all the witnesses to give their uh, uh, um, uh, testimony in court. If each one took 10 minutes, you could go, go at it like that. But no, no, people are rejected because they have their religion. Be they atheists? Oh, atheists are the most religious bunch of all. Okay, let's move on. But finally, Daniel. Ah, oh, here's Daniel. Does it say Belteshazzar, his uh, Babylonian name? No. <laughs> and this is Nebuchadnezzar writing. He says, Daniel. Wow. Daniel, what does that mean? Daniel, God is my judge. So the name of Jehovah is prevailing after all these years, the trusted advisor. Daniel, not Belteshazzar. So Belteshazzar uh, has to do with the god Bel, which was the Babylonian form of Baal. And it's Bel that we find in Babel, the uh, uh, the gate or uh, the gate of God. Uh, okay, but finally Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my god. Well, he says Daniel before he ever says Belteshazzar, so he's definitely given that priority. Uh, and again, what did we find here? That this is uh, uh, retracing the movement of the, the Hebrew children from uh, uh, Judah uh, to Babylon was an undoing, as it were, of the journey of Abraham out of the land of Shinar, China, uh, or the Chaldees was more southern, uh, more, south, more to the south than uh, Babel was. And here we have these uh, Hebrew children returning to the plain of Shinar. And instead of uh, being unpaganized, being given the name Abraham and then Abraham by God, we have them given um, pagan names. But this is undoing itself here. Little by little, as it were, this is undoing, even at the lips of the king, the mighty king Nebuchadnezzar, in whom is a spirit, uh, is a spirit. This is interesting. The other, other translations say the spirits. But here it says, 
the spirit of the Ruach, spirit of the holy gods. This is interesting. It uses the plural, Elah, God. But again, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know Hebrew, but you can see yourself. It's saying um, God, God, gods. So there are variant, uh, variant readings. Is a spirit. That's interesting. It uses the uh, 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 indefinite article. Asper, interesting. I related the dream to him, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians. Is Daniel a magician? No, he's head over the magicians. And again, those those words are quite interesting in that um, some it goes to the, uh, the magicians, diviners, and uh, Chaldeans, and so on. And they're essentially administrators and people who are analysts, it would seem, from my understanding of it. Uh, but there's no hint of Daniel ever touching magic. <laughs> it, but in God's providence, he's given the command over them. Anyway, since I know what it, that, the, that a spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream, which I have seen along with its interpretation. Aha! I didn't notice this before, so he's telling him, tell me the visions of my dream. So he's telling again. I'm so confident in Daniel. I want him to tell me the dream. I haven't. Uh, the rest of the bunch has been told the dream. But Daniel, how superior is the wisdom of God and how God can enable us to do more than the worldlings. Oh, for the grace to uh, serve God more. Now, these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. Oh, perhaps I was wrong. He's now relating uh, the dream to Daniel. Pardon me. Sorry, got ahead of myself. Now, these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking and behold, there was a tree, a tree, one, two, tree. There was a tree, a ah, tree, 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 tree. We've had a, um, a statue before and a stone and so on, but a tree, a tree. I wonder, are there trees in the Bible? Oh, yes, there are. Oh, we have a very important tree, two very important trees in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, you know, the world is far closer to God in some ways, although it rebels, rebels against him, far closer to God, knows far more about God than it lets on, as it were. And this supremely is the age where people have denied any, um, tried to crush the memory of God. But don't forget that every living man came from Ham, Shem and Japheth, came from Noah, Noah's line. And... Um, uh, I'm talking about Abraham, Abraham, um, he uh, he was alive when Noah was still alive, and Abra and uh, his son uh, Shem, and doubtless Japheth as well, were still alive. And uh, the, the knowledge of the the uh, the flood story, we all know that every culture that an anthropologist has ever gone to has some form of flood myth. A garbled form, like the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh, a garbled form of the true account. And so this is what we have. We have cultures that start off with a knowledge of God as a culture and then decline from that and are brought back only when uh, God sends out his uh, missionaries, his, his uh, apostles, as it were. As in, for example, John Patton, apostle to the New Hebrides. But any anyway... Uh, there's a knowledge of these symbols and they are incredibly important. And again, you look at so many cultures and they have this symbol of the tree and this, the, the tree is in the midst of the earth. Where was the tree? A uh, tree of life in the midst of the garden. People know, all these cultures know. They resist, Romans 1 tell us, but they know. This is just the truth that we have to deal with. These symbols, the typology, is so important. Uh, the tree grew large and became strong and its height reached to the sky. He's made it. The Tower of Babel never quite touched the sky, as it were. But where do man's dreams of world dominion, control of the world, of touching the sky, of connecting with the heavens and then controlling them, where does that, uh, where does that happen? We've heard it before, uh, in fantasy land, in your dreams. When will uh, the WEF, the the, um, the USSR, CCP, CCP, uh, when will they have world dominion? When will they control us totally? 
in their dreams and in their dreams only. <laughs> this is the assurance from God that he'll confound and confuse um, the, Tower of, uh, the Tower of Babel. And any dominion that he gives into the hands of wicked men is to extend his purpose in judgment, to um, bring God's people back to judge. All right. And its height reached to the sky. Boom. Finished. Complete. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. And its foliage was beautiful. And its fruit abundant. Who else? So they got the tree of life. A tree. Is there anything about Christ here? Because Christ is the center after all. Uh, he, he's, the, he's the true center. The kingdom of God is the true center as well. Seek first the kingdom. Um, but is there anything about Christ and a tree? A tree, a tree. Well, uh, oh, hang on a minute. Well, I am the vine. I am the true vine. And apart from me, you can bear no fruits. But uh, my me, uh, my uh, my word dwells in you. Uh, you will bear uh, much fruit. So the, the, the picture here is one taken from the hearts of Assyrian and then after that Neo-Babylonian um, myth and lore. Very important and ultimately taken from God's picture. Uh, God's picture book, God's book of typology. They, they say, uh, Chester and I, I think, so, uh, said that Satan was the ape of God. He imitated God. But man, even in rebellion, has to use the categories that God has given to him. And so it ends up with this tree. But the true tree is Christ himself, from which life comes, from which fruit, uh, in whom only we bear fruit. Okay. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant and it was food for all. Wow, free food. There's no such thing as a free lunch. The beasts of the field found shade under it. Remember earlier that we see that God gave um, Nebuchadnezzar dominion even over the animals. And here we have it again. And the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches and all living creatures fed themselves from it. Wow, this really is the centre you can't, uh, if you don't go here to the centre, well, you're not going to be protected from predators by being under its foliage, like you see chickens run, running under a tree to escape the hawks. Uh, and if you want food, you better go to this tree. You better you better run there. Otherwise, you're going to die. There's death out, uh, without this tree. And that's true of Christ, isn't he? Um, uh, the sustainer, the spirit is the sustainer. Christ is the sustainer. He upholds creation. But no, oh, in the dreams of man, it's man, we'll find out, that sustains creation. Oh, help us if that were the case. Okay. Ah, boom. What happens here? I was looking in the visions of my mind as I lay on my bed. And behold, this is like the second part of the dream, an angelic watcher. A lot of stuff, a lot of nonsense is talked about the watcher that, oh, from uh, this, uh, that and the other one. Uh, a waking or wakeful one, one who, one who watches, one who, um, well, of course, the angel's going to watch for uh, uh, the slightest movement of God's hand, as it were, the Holy One descended from heaven. And what are angels? What are angelic watchers? The, the angelic here is in italics because in watcher, uh, you have implied the fact that it's an angel. I mean, there are categories there's uh, the beasts and there's all the minerals and the stuff of the universe there's god himself and there's angels what else is there well, there's no special category there's a hierarchy within the angels and there are m many different types of beasts and uh, fish and what have you but there's no other category and people will spin you a yarn about that and this that and the other thing and build a whole system on this or oh, the watchers and the secret knowledge and all this stuff but no, this is an envoy from God. Although the word is only used in Daniel, this particular one. A holy one descended from heaven. So he's coming from heaven. He's coming from God's throne room. Throne room, that's what heaven is. Ah. So from one throne to the other, as it were. Who's the king of kings, eh? He shouted out and spoke as follows. Chop down the tree, uh-oh, and cut off its branches. Strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground. But with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field, and let it 
let him let him oh let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share heaven now that's interesting uh for heaven there and uh, where did the, where did they watch her come from from heaven shamayin was it huh so it's under heaven uh, so heaven is used in a figurative sense there are several senses of course in which heaven is used beast of the grass let his mind be changed from that of a man and let a beast's mind be given to him wow we and let seven periods of time pass over him not seven years seven periods of time and of course seven is a number of perfection or uh, perfection meaning fullness and uh, otherwise maturity and so on but uh, the right amount of time this sentence is by the the decree of the angelic watchers in verse 25 we find that uh, it's not by their initiative no it's it comes from god Uh, it comes from the throne itself angels are messengers of god envoys of god and the decision is a command of the holy ones what does it say here kadish okay in order that the living may know that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind Again, we have rulership, lordship, sovereignty, ruling over man. And many, many people try to tell you that the important bits of the Bible are spiritual, meaning in the pagan sense spiritual. And really, the Bible has nothing to say about the nasty world of matter, the nasty world of politics and kings and so on. But from one end of the, uh, of the Bible to the other, we have this. We're face to face, face to face with it, so we can go to the Bible with our present political uh, and uh, political quandaries and uh, and so on. It's not a spiritual ma- manual in the sense of being a non-material, up in the air, pie in the sky when you die manual. This is saying that heaven, that uh, rules over the realm of mankind. So anything you see that you can think of that happens down here on earth is ruled from the throne of God even the mightiest uh, emperor such as the king of kings Nebuchadnezzar is ruled by uh, from the throne of heaven by the Lord God and bestows it on whom he wishes so if you see someone um, less than glorious less than competent uh, in a position of power, you can be assured God has bestowed that on him for a reason uh, and sets o- over it the lowliest of men. Okay, this is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, he refers, he reverts to uh, the name Belteshazzar. Uh, I think uh, it. I had to look far and wide to find the meaning of Belteshazzar, but I believe it means... Uh, Bell protect the boundaries, something like that. Tell me its interpretation. Bell being Beal or Lord or tell me its interpretation. Inasmuch as none of the wise men of my kingdom is able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. And what gives us our wisdom? What is wisdom in the wisdom is the logos of God, and uh, um, we have wisdom uh, personified in the book of Proverbs and what what uh, what is wisdom but the spirit of Christ the spirit of God in us and that does give us a superior wisdom there is no doubt about it if uh, to the extent to which we subject our minds to the mind of God and as Van Til says think God's thoughts after him then we have wisdom I know we're going on but I'm just taking my time and enjoying this it's so good praise the Lord then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, Daniel first, Belteshazzar second, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. And I'm sure he had a deep affection for the king, for one thing. I'm sure he thought, what's going to happen to me if the king ends up in this position? Um, what You know, a seven-year period, perhaps? Or uh, the is, is anarchy going to ensue? What will happen? Or, more to the point, more immediately probably, is he going to get angry? He burst out into an angry fit with the um, sorcerer, uh, the Chaldeans and the magicians and so on. 
in in chapter two at the first vision, he uh, became wroth uh, in chapter three, and uh, had uh, tried to have um, Daniel, uh, Hananiah, uh, Michelle, and Azariah burnt to death. Is he going to go mad again and do something completely <laughs> irrational? Well, there was a fair chance of it. How dare you tell me this? So there was a miracle here, and the hand of God was here, in that he received the word. Uh, okay, he, he wasn't a Christian, at the, he wasn't a believer in, in, uh, in Christ. And I say Christ because Old and New Testament were saved by believing in Christ, in his atonement, his sacrifice, and so on. So the king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dreamer its interpretation alarm you. Oh, interesting. Belteshazzar replied, my lord. It's interesting, lord. Mm, lord, interesting. If only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. Okay. The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky, when are the plans of the uh, ungodly, the godless, accomplished in their dreams only, and was visible to all the earth, and his foliage was beautiful, and its fruit abundant. And this is God's plan for the world. Uh, this is part of the dominion mandate. He gave, um, he gave Adam and Eve the stewardship of a bountiful world, and he says, replenish the earth and subdue it, and um, to, to make it even more a fruitful uh, and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant. Uh, and and we, when we see a lack, when we see a dearth, we should think, well, this is God's hand. This is part of the curse of God. And we pray to God and we say, Lord, uh, advance your kingdom, advance your cause. We think of the um, very great material um, blessings that uh, Isaiah speaks of in the Messianic kingdom. And... Uh, Yes, anyway, we think of creation groaning for the revelation of the sons of God, that the sons of God should be the sons of God and accomplish their God-given purpose, which God has never wavered from, that all the earth should be under the hand of man. And this uh, idea of man uh, ruling the earth, man uh, exploiting in a good way, uh, in a godly way, the resources of the earth, is so unpopular today because of the it's an aspect of the anti-christian spirit of our age that this is hated and resented but it's what creation was meant for for abundance super abundance but well, a lack of oil and there's a lack of this and there's a lack of that well it's all ultimately lies but all the worldling sees is lack it doesn't matter what you tell them um thomas malthus said when the earth was peopled by hundreds of times fewer people than, uh, well, a lot fewer people than there were today. All Jeremy Bentham, uh, was it Bentham? No. Uh, what, what dismal science, what do you call it? Malthus, Thomas Malthus. All he could see was a lack because he was an unbeliever, because he didn't know the power of God and the purpose of God, under which the beasts of the field dwelt and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged, it is you, O king. Wow. Not only was he the head of gold, but the, he was in his dreams. He was in his dreams, <laughs> again, I emphasize. He was the tree of life. For you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty. Now, stop a minute here. Man is made in the image of God. And there's a famous, uh, perhaps confusing initially, psalm that talks about, ye are gods, but ye shall die like men. And it talks, uh, my understanding of it is, that yeah, this refers to judges who stand in the place of God uh, in a special way. They are to be mute as to their own thoughts and judge according to the to the word of God. In that way, they re rep represent uh, gods. But uh, we, we, we image God in all sorts of ways. So in a way, uh, for his age, yes, he, he could be a tree of life for those who um, whom he ruled. So, you know, but if we think of ourselves as the source, without reference to the vine, the true vine, I'm the true vine, 
I am the life, Christ says. If we think of ourselves and of mankind and of the resources of the earth as our uh, resource, oh boy, what a burden. Uh, it's to think of ourselves as God. Anyway, great and reach the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. Uh, all his dreams became true. In some ways, man had to become God in his dreams. Everything ate everything. In that, the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, and yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it, the new, in the new grass of the field, and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him share with the beasts of the field. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. A couple of sentences ago, he was like a god. He, uh, he, he, he had total dominion over the whole earth. He, he was a tree that touched the, touched heaven, touched the sky. Ah, and yet, now, in an instant, he's brought down to the level of the beasts. And of course, the more we, uh, man assumes himself to be God, the more beastly is his behaviour. If we're small people, we will be beastly, we will, we will manifest our uh, godhood, inverted commas, by being insufferable and by demanding that everybody dance around us and that everybody serve us. Whoa, how terrible that is, how insufferable. Boy, I've done that. Uh, but if you're a king like this, you make yourself like Stalin. Stalin, of course, killed a lot of people. And Stalin wasn't his name. It was uh, Giorgio Dragovich. I don't know what it was. It was some, uh, a Georgian name, I think. But at any rate, Stalin is the Russian for steel. He became, I'm becoming more than a man. I'm transcending my manhood. I'm becoming steel. But he was steel in the sense of, well, we think of Christ with his rod of iron. And he would beat all these peoples into submission. Um, the more God, uh, the, the more that we think of ourselves as God, um, well, the less, uh, the less like man we are. Our destiny is to be man. And man in the Hebrew is, there are various words, but Adama, Adama, of the earth. There's no transcending our earthly nature. We will always be man, and that's the glorious thing, serving under God. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king. And you think of all these people that seem untouchable, no matter what they do, no matter what they say. They seem untouchable. Oh, God, what can we do here? Oh, what are you going to do? Uh, things seem um, impossible. But this is how God, God rules, by decree. And when he decrees it, it's done. Now, when the European Union make a decree that uh, there's going to be... Uh, uh, a war in Ukraine and we're going to take over Ukraine and or for example uh, we're going to um, some manufacturer says we're going to make this miracle cure and it's going to call, cure the flu and this other virus well their decrees are somewhat uh, you know flexible and oh yes by the way we're going to ban all cars and we're going to ban cash and we're going to do this and we're going to replace this currency with another currency well their decrees they aren't worth much. We can't really depend on them. Maybe they'll happen, maybe not. But God's decree is sure and certain. It is eternal. It comes from outside time. Wow. And he has all these um, angels, legions of angels, to carry out his commands. And we are uh, invited to participate in the work of God. In uh, And we have a central role in that, an important role in that, of building his kingdom. That you be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field. And you be given grass to eat like cattle. Cattle, cattle, cattle. Uh, a bullock, bulls, cattle. Okay, And be drenched with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognise that the Most High is ruler. Ah, ruler over the realm of mankind. Uh, Inash, ruler. Shall it... Ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Again, no matter what, uh, how glorious or inglorious our leaders are, they're there by the hand of God. That's why we have to be very careful in not being revolutionaries and um, not 
rebelling against whom God has given to us. If we want to change our rulers, we have to become better ourselves. We have to petition God. We have to do things uh, uh, through the proper channels. Now, there are exceptions to that and so on that we have in the, in the word. But uh, yeah, uh, they are God's appointed, good or bad. It doesn't mean submission to everything they say. Far from it. They themselves are servants. They are ministers, as Romans 13 sell, uh, tells us uh, as well. So at any rate. Now, what happens as well as man becomes God? And this, of course, is the idea of the transhumanists that they will transcend their Adama, their earthly nature, their dust nature. We are made of the dust of the ground and we're going to be uh, incarnated and, and spiritualized into computers and live forever. <laughs> what misery. Again, what happens? They become like beasts. Do not be like the horse or mule who have no understanding. You must be um, led about by the bit and bridle. But uh, what else? What, what company does he have? No company at all. He's waiting for God. Oh, he's, uh, he's at the no exit. He's nowhere to go. He's on his own. And Sartre said, God is no problem to me because I am God. But my neighbor, well, if I am God, my neighbor is the devil. In this age, which purports to be an age of no gods, we have more gods than the Hindus ever have because every man is his own God. Genesis 3, 5, determining that which is right. Uh, uh, um, determining uh, what is good and what is evil. For himself, he's making up his own ethical playbook as he goes. But there is no community possible between gods if there's one God and there's another God, well, they have to fight for supremacy. And again, this would be God who has reached the sky and whose um, who shelters and suckers and uh, uh, provides for all the earth. Well, he ends up totally isolated, totally on his own, uh, or beastly and alone. And that's, in a way, a picture of hell. Um, totally unable to communicate with anybody else, ter tormented with our inner torment. Anyway, and it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree. Your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Often we think of uh, the Christian faith or it's told to us that it's impractical. It'll never work and it can't be too strict and you have to make compromises. And, uh, you know, it's not really, it's a thing for the, the church and the spiritual realm, but he will only have his kingdom assured to him when he obeys God, when he acknowledges the sovereignty of God, not as an abstract concept that you say, I believe in the sovereignty of God, in abstraction, no. This was as a ruler, as a ruler. And this is part, this letter that he's writing to all the earth and all the languages is part of that um, repentance. It's part of his fulfilling that mission when you recognize that it is heaven that rules. And we see how shaky and how um, self-undermining all the uh, nations of the world are that are participating in this madness that we have all around us, that we see all around us today, where people identify as this and that and the other thing. Oh, what a clown show. Uh, an established kingdom comes only when, it, when, it, when we acknowledge the sovereignty of God and it's an interesting fact to consider that Constantinople was a far more um, long-lasting endeavor than Rome ever was. And Constanti Constantinople uh, had its own weird and wonderful divergences from the Christian faith. But for the sake of argument, it was a Christian nation uh, and it had an enduring power. It is heaven that rules. And this is what I said when I meant that uh, the... Chaldeans couldn't understand it. They, uh, through their arts and uh, dark arts, whatever, were able to somehow interpret. So they thought the trends of the, of the universe and uh, the powers that be and the forces that are moving. And the idea of a self-conscious God is totally alien to them. But further than that, one God, 
who is sovereign, who who uh, controls um, who controls the world, that is alien. That is repulsive to the pagan mind, to the godless mind, and to the extent that a Christian hates the idea of God ruling and reigning. Well, to the extent to that extent, they're lacking sanctification. Uh, but this is what he has to acknowledge as king that. Uh, that it, it is heaven that rules, and this is uh, topsy-turvy, incomprehensible for the pagan mind. God rules? Well, d- and many Christians have this idea, and it's a Kantian idea, a pagan idea, that there's heaven and all the spiritual stuff where I get my feelings from, and uh, the church as well. Well, that's ruled by God, certainly, but the everyday um, affairs of life, the money and uh, politics and business and all sorts well that's not god's domain oh no 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 what is this telling us in black and white after you recognize that it is heaven heaven that rules are we even as godly as nebuchadnezzar do we acknowledge that heaven rules or are we worried that it's going to be the cbdc's it's going to be some uh, enacted legislation that says uh, you can only go on the internet if you say that Nicholas Sturgeon is as honest as the day is long or some other thing. No. Well, here's the here's a tremendous encouragement that uh, heaven rules, heaven rules. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Oh, this is not part of the the uh, the uh, dream, not part of the interpretation. He is saying he doesn't want uh, the king to have to go through that. He knows that the judgment of God is fierce. He has seen the judgment of God. Why is is he in Babylon in the first place? He knows how terrible and gut-wrenching it was to be torn away from his land, torn away from his people, see his people punished. And he knows that this will be a hard judgment. And he knows God. He, He isn't given this from God in a special revelation, but he knows that, uh, like with Nineveh, that pagan kingdom, they were just given a sentence of death by Jonah, as the scripture records us. Records it. You're, go- you're all going to die. God's going to judge you. But what did they do? They knew something about God's nature. Psalm 19. or And I'm sure they would have, uh, that perhaps uh, Jonah was not the first missionary there. But at any, any rate, this godless nation, this violent nation, turned and humbled themselves and sought God. And they were saved. And for a generation, uh, they were uh, a much better people. He said, break away now from your sins by doing righteousness. How do we know we're we're saved? Is it because of the quality of your experience? Uh, Well, no, it's not to do with the quality of your conversion experience. It's to do with producing fruit in terms of righteousness. Are we doing what God asks us to do? Sidak, right doing righteousness and righteousness is defined by the law of God and what is the new covenant as the Bible describes it Jeremiah 33 31 I think it is that God writes his law on our hearts that's the essence of the new covenant I will make a new covenant with you the problem with the old covenant was not it in itself but uh, there was no evil with the laws the evil the uh, the lack came from man's disobedience. So God says, I will give you a new heart. I will write uh, my law on your heart. I will give you a heart of flesh. And a heart of flesh obeys God and says, God, what would you have me to do? And we all pray for more of that. Break away from your sins. Okay, a moral element. He's preaching the gospel. He's saying this is what you have to do. And from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. He's giving him a specific example. Jesus gave um, Zacchaeus a specific thing to do. Uh, well, it, well, Zacchaeus knew what to do. And because of Zacchaeus's repentance and um, his restitution to those whom he had defrauded, he said, today salvation has come to this house. So it's very often something very specific that you, um, you will have to do. Not that that saves you, but it's certainly a sign of um, a changed heart. Only um, The only obedience possible is the obedience of faith. The vision fulfilled, and this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected and said, 
Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? And the Bible defines this, of course, as pride, and it is pride, but this is pride that's baked into the cake of the godless system. What do you have in the godless system? You have man as God. You have the orig original sin, Genesis 3, 5. You will be as God, knowing good and evil. That is determining what your uh, what good and evil is your, uh, yourself. You, like a God, you say something and it happens. Think and grow rich. You don't even have to say it. And what we have with the Tower of Babel is elitism. You have the common herd at zero level and you go up, 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 up until you get to the king. And the king is literally in this system and it's unavoidable. He is a different kind of being than the, uh, the mass of people. And so he can order people about. They're not the same kind of... He is better than you. They are better than you in this pagan system. So he was pious, uh, it would seem, according to this system. It was a pride that was born of his right his adherence to the system. It's like Paul said that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Okay, And Phariseeism is messed up as related to Christian faith. But he was a real good... And boy, Dari, um, Nebuchadnezzar, he was a real good one. He was a real good one. Now, he was asked to do two, two things, to, to do righteousness and to uh, have mercy to the poor. Now, what is mercy to the poor in our own day, uh, the day of the state, the day where the state is the tree of life? Well, the state, of course, is the tree of life. It is the centre Naturally, you have to have a license from the state. It's only normal. It's only normal that the state uh, prints money out of thin air. Well, of course they can create ex nihilo. That's not a problem. And of course we get our um, prosperity, our fruit, our abundant protection. It all comes from the state without reference to God somehow. Now, what, what is it, what is virtue uh, for the Tower of Babel and this is in Babel, this is in Babylon. Virtue is that we be not scattered. Why do they build the Tower of Babel? Why do people build empires? Why was Babylon built? And he talks about building, doesn't he? Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built? He was asked to do righteousness, and it seems like a non sequitur that he comes up with a building program. It seems unrelated, but it is not unrelated in the mind of the um, uh, in the mind of the pagan, because for the pagan, uh, righteousness is building the city of man. And we have to bear in mind as we try to understand the diabolical actions of uh, those in control, um, putting old people into, uh, you know what happened initially with uh, the whole coronavirus thing where. Old people uh, were, who were infected were put into old people's homes. Oh, tremendous evil. But why, why do they do these things? Well, we think, yeah, it's just malice, just evil. But bear in mind that what the Bible says, the tender mercies of the wicked, the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. And so here, he hears righteousness. He thinks, well, I'll build the city of man. Because after all, the city of man is where protection comes from, where provision comes from. And the uh, all the powers that be in the heavens have come to focus in uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who has taken the hand of the gods, who is in fellowship with the gods, and he is the focal point for whatever gods might be at that point in history. And his job is to protect everyone, uh, that they be not scattered. Union is the right is the righteous thing. Union that people be one. And what did he do? He took a, a people group, a nation. From one part to the other and he mixes them around like Stalin mixed uh, the Germans put them into Kazakhstan like today we see a great movement of people that is not just uh, what that reflects this principle and we see lots of advertising on the uh, YouTube and we see lots of films and so on which try to erase our history erase our nation tell you tell you that nations are evil uh, for the Babel builders be it in 600 BC or 660 odd BC 
or the Babel Builders today, and of course the Parliament Building in um, in Babel is uh, a copy, as it were, an updated version of Peter Bruegel, Bruggen, something like that. His painting, his depiction of the Tower of Babel, half completed. Uh, the Babel build they're very self-conscious in their imitation of this, and in the in this system, righteousness is statist. Righteousness is building up the state. They're doing it to save you. After all, why are um, uh, why is it, why is there all this um, regulation and red tape? It's to save us. It's to save the environment. They're saving, saving us, saving salvation. Yeah, they're in the salvation business very self consciously. And he was told to give mercy. And very often, we what we see today, and uh, what we have seen in the Roman Empire, for example, is that their mercy to the poor was to give them bread and circuits, circuses and I can't imagine anything to, uh, very different in Nebuchadnezzar's day. Give them free stuff but the tender tender mercy of the wicked is cruel. So what do we what do? We do we give free housing, we give the dole and so on and it destroys the people. It makes them dependent. It takes them, uh, converts them from a working class to an underclass. Oh, how horrible. An underclass, they're stuck there. There's two and three generations of uh, people not working. Uh, how can you develop character? How can you maintain character when you're uh, a uh, essentially, in biblical terms, a um, a man with a pierced ear? You're um, you're like a eunuch. It's a, it's a humbling, it's a humiliating thing. Uh, if he wanted to know righteousness, Daniel was right there. Could have asked him what what constitutes righteousness, righteousness, but it didn't occur to him. If we want to know what righteousness is, in specific instances, we must go to the law of God, the law of Christ. Is Christ different from God? No, the law of God, the law of Christ, they're not two different things. Is God Christ? Christ is God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's no disharmony there. Not the least of it. And of course, so much of our law comes from, uh, so much of the common law comes from straight out of the Bible with some uh, local colorings. While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is decree declared sovereignty. Ha 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 ha. There's the word. Sovereignty. Oh, read royalty, kingdom, government uh, has been removed from you. And God can like that, take away the sovereignty from um, the former Polish Empire, from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, from uh, the Great Spanish Empire, Portuguese Empire, Dutch Empire, British Empire. It's not a problem to God. From one moment to the next, this king, who had all the sovereignty in the world, more than any other, just taken from him. And when we pray, we realize we pray to a king, the true king, who can do these things as he wills. And you will be driven away from mankind. Your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle. And seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. Again, we cannot be Christians and say that, well, there's one rule for uh, the world and there's another rule uh, the world is a neutral realm and there's another rule for the church and so on oh no 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 oh absolutely not that's a terrible thing uh, the most highest ruler over them uh, and this is before his incarnation this is before the giving of the new covenant is he less powerful now now that he is the uh, uh, the god man christ jesus it's ridiculous to even think so. The Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from mankind. What kind of a God is that? And began eating grass like a vegan uh, cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers. Eagle's feathers. A man with the head of an eagle. This was a Babylonian god. Ha <laughs> ha, interesting. And his nails became like bird's claws. Hmm. That would be fingernails and toenails. Nails. Um, interesting that if you if you imagine a man on all fours with uh, 
clause on all fours and with uh, this hair, well, to me, see what you think, it's rather like a lion. And the lion, of course, was a symbol of the strength of Babylon. And here he's taken the symbols, uh, the god of Babylon, one of the gods of key gods of Babylon, and the symbol of the strength of Babylon. And as it were, he's making a visual picture that uh, what appears to you as your hope and your exaltation, as, as your strength, no, it's beastly. It, it, it's, uh, it's something to be mocked and pitied uh, to have uh, such uh, rulers like that, uh, such a conception of the world like that. And uh, trusting in God doesn't make us less than man. Trusting in man and thinking of, of ourselves as God does make us, in the end, less than men. And you think about this uh, transgender craze, well, what happens to so many men, oh dear, thinking that they can identify as this and that and the other thing, which was an a aspect of Marx's teaching, that um, you would have plenary ability to do anything you wanted once the revolution happened. Well, you end up getting bits chopped off. You're less than a man. Terrible, terrible injustice. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. Remember, this is Nebuchadnezzar writing to the whole world. The whole world is not ignorant. and The history of the world is far from unmarked by the Bible. The Bible wasn't done something done in the corner and done in the corner. This is the greatest kingdom that ever was, uh, humanly speaking, the head of gold. And we have the greatest king, the head of gold, shouting, trumpeting God's sovereignty, God's kingdom to all. And he was obviously humbling himself. Um, uh, sin was pride, and that is the master sin, is it not? And what does the Bible tell, tell us? Pride comes before a fall. So we see all these proud politicians imagining themselves to be un untouchable. In God's ordination, pride comes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. And yet God in his grace did not destroy him. What do you do if you chop a tree down and leave its roots? God had a plan for, uh, meaning that it'll grow, grow again, whether you want to want it to or not. Unless you poison the stump or yank it up or grind it down, it's gonna uh, it's gonna keep on shooting up. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Endures. What is the enduring kingdom? All these. Uh, the Fourth Reich, the Third Reich, I don't know which Reich, uh, the, the, the Soviet Empire, the, the, the communist world, they were, all to, um, they were all to be the enduring kingdom, the British Empire. But no, the seemingly most delicate and vulnerable uh, uh, kingdom, the kingdom of God, endures from generation to generation. Nothing left out in between, generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven. He does what he wills. This is history. God doing as he wills. And among the inhabitants of the earth. So uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all that dwell therein. That covers everything. Of course we know he's Lord of the angels. But on earth he rules. He's the Lord of the stuff and the people. And to those that would try to fence God off into heaven or a future time, no, 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 no. God is Lord right now. He does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward him off, or some translations say, slap his hand. Or say, what have you done? And as we think of how things unfolded and the lockdown and uh, some of the tragedies and heartaches that happened, we realised that we can't complain to God and say, well, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why do you do that? We know that this was done by an all-wise God. Mm -hmm. And at this time, my reason returned to me, and my majesty and, my, and splendor was restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counsellors and nobles began seeking me out, so that I was re-established in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. If we humble ourselves, uh, God 
resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. He exalts the humble. What did he, what did he do with Job? Job, he tested him. He took everything away from him. But he gave him much, much, much more. So if, And God is the one who gives this. He's not unconcerned with the stuff that happens on the earth. No, he's intensely concerned about that stuff. And he will reward. And again, people say, oh, that's, you can't say God rewards. It's terrible. It's so fleshly. It's so awful. No, here we have God's word. He uh, again and again rewards those who humble himself and rewards them. He can reward them um, after time, out of time, and it, co- and it can reward them and so many and so often does in time in a very material and visible way. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is the greatest tract ever written. <laughs> Praise, exalt, and honor the King of Heaven for all the King of Heaven, the Heavenly King. Does He just reign reign in Heaven? Is His kingdom not of this world? Oh, please, buy a dictionary. For all His works are true, and His ways are just. His ways are just, as defined by His law, and He is able to humble those who walk in pride. He was sent. I'm. I walked in pride. And again, pride was impossible for a man who considers himself to be a god. So he's upending the whole system. He's blowing minds. He has the mind of Christ now in a very real way. He has the Spirit of God revealing these things to him that it's impossible for the carnal mind to accept. And we wonder what the reaction to this tremendous uh, letter was. Is he able to humble my husband, my wife, my um, boss, my the ruler of my country, uh, this shadowy figure in the darkness? <laughs> he is able to humble those who walk in pride. He's able. And um, but much better to humble ourselves. And uh, praise the Lord. So it took over an hour to do that, which is par for the course, probably. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. hope you found the um, the Hebrew fun. Uh, I don't read Hebrew, but I can read the uh, definitions, you know. Uh, it, it, it's fun to see. So praise the Lord for that. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, uh, see you another time.